Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. In recent weeks, we have referenced many times on this radio program that there was a time that Jews, Christians, and Muslims mostly lived peacefully side by side in Palestine before the fall of the Ottoman Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. Today, as we continue our series of conversations about the history of Palestine, we're going to talk specifically about this time of coexistence and how it came apart. My guest for this is Usama Maktasi. Usama Maktasi is a professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of several books. His most recent is called The Age of Coexistence, The Economical Frame, and The Making of the Modern Arab World. Usama Maktasi, it's my good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thank you. It's good to be here with you. In in this history of coexistence, I I suspect tolerance, of course, nothing's ever perfect, and and we'll talk about these things. Uh, But is this a period that we're just talking about the late Ottoman Empire, or is this something that spans the entire empire, which I think is approximately 600, you know, ex- existed for like 600 years or so? Um, well, actually, this, this period actually predates the Ottoman Empire, but the book, of course, focuses on the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire in the Arab East uh, was lasted 400 years. But of course, there was Islamic rule in the Arab East before the Ottomans, and so the, the thesis that I'm presenting basically was was is a book and an idea that I'm sort of presenting to challenge two basic sort of myths that that predominate and stereotype the Middle East. One is that people in the Middle East have been fighting each other forever on the basis of religious or sectarian differences, and that is a total myth. And the second one is sort of the counter myth, which is slightly more benevolent, but nevertheless also a myth that people just got along fine forever and ever and ever. And and really, the history is much more complex. But in essence, there was a culture of coexistence without any doubt that uh, it before the modern period, and that has been ravaged in the modern period, mostly, I would say, by the forces of colonialism that have distorted totally the, the Arab East, uh, the Mashriq, the Arab East, uh, the Middle East, and so on. You mentioned the the term the mashrik. What, what does that mean? Well, it means the, it means the it's the the mashrik and the maghrib. The mashrik is where the sun sort of rises. The mash the maghrib is where the sun sets. The east versus the west. So the Arab, in other words, an idea of the Arab East as opposed to the the, the north North Africa. What we would say North Africa or Morocco or the West, which is Morocco and so on. So the Arab East basically would encompass what is today Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, Jordan. You know, and if and conceptually, I would include, of course, Iraq and Egypt as well. So a, a cohesive area that was under Ottoman, that was under one Ottoman sovereign rule, and that was fragmented by the British and the French after World War One. So, if if there's an Arab East, does that mean there was an Arab West? Yeah, I mean, you could. Yeah, we could say there. There's. I mean, the, the Arab. The, the term is mashriq in Arabic, which literally just means it. And it, we. I refer to it in English as the Arab East. It's. You can also refer to it as the mashriq. Um, yes, there is an Arab West. There's an Islamic West. There is. There's also. I mean, these are all heuristic categories that help us think through ideas of space and geography. It's interesting, though. What What, what does Arab mean? Is it ethnicity? Is Is it linked to a language, culture? It's all of those. It's basically most more than anything else. It's an identification. It's how one identifies, how one self identifies, um, how one, uh, and it could be in relationship to language. But of course, there are many people today, especially in the West, West, as in the United States, Europe, uh, and other parts of the non-Arab world who are of Arab heritage who don't necessarily speak Arabic, uh, but certainly identify as Arab. So I would I would actually in, in, enlarge the traditional conventional idea is anyone who speaks Arabic. But I think that's a that's an insufficient definition. It really is anyone who identifies as an Arab, and it's a multi-religious. This is the crucial part. It's a multi-religious identity because it encompasses Muslims and Christians and Jews and others who who identify as Arab first and foremost. In other words, a sense of uh, identity and identification with with those who come from what we call the Arab world. I'm going to go back just for a moment into distant history, and we'll be coming right back to this late period of the Ottoman Empire. But but I mean, since we're here, I, I do want to ask about terms and who's who, because frequently you'll, you'll hear the argument that 
you know, pro-Zionists will say we, we were the indigenous people. Well, we were the first people here 2,000 years ago in Palestine. The Arabs don't come until the Arab conquest, until mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, the 7th century. What yeah. was the Arab conquest, and did that, did that change the people who were in the area? I mean, you're, you're asking a very sort of, first of all, to answer the question about the Zionists, I mean, that, that's total myth. The idea of saying that, that, that uh, Jews are the indigenous population of Palestine sort of presupposes that those who were there before the Jewish people were, were not there or don't count or not relevant. And second of all, the Zionists themselves were mostly coming from Europe um, and they're not indigenous to Palestine. There were, of course, Jews who are indigenous to Palestine and there are Jewish communities that are indigenous uh, to the Middle East, for sure, just as there are Muslims and Christians. So I'm not too hung up on the idea of who was there first several thousand years ago, because that's almost that's an irrelevant debate. And it's an, also an impossible debate. It really is an impossible debate. And it can't really be taken seriously as a basis of any kind of politics of the present, because people's come and go and there's all sorts of change and intermixture. And so um, obviously, the, before the Arab conquest, the people who were there, um, so in other words, in the in the seventh century and eighth century, the people who were in what we today, since you're asking about Palestine, would have been uh, a largely Christian population. Um, this was under Byzantine rule, and um, and it was a mixture. There was a it was again just like Palestine remained throughout its its uh, late antiquity, medieval, late modern, early modern periods, all the way until today. Palestine was and remains a multi-religious and multi-ethnic space. Uh, multi-religious more than anything else. And so we date the Arab conquest, obviously, to when when the Muslim conquest of the, the Mashlik took place and um, of Syria, of, of the Byzantine uh, Empire took place. I mean, I guess the way I saw it, but, but I'm not a historian, is that with the Arab conquest, it, it wasn't that you had, a, you know, a, a great migration of people from, say, you know, modern day Yemen or, or Saudi Arabia come to the come to Palestine in that area, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and just take over it that sort of they did have a conquest, but it was more, but the conquest eventually would have been more political and cultural. Yes. And also, I mean, again, we're talking about, we're talking about like centuries and centuries and centuries ago. So it's hard to, it's, it's, it's in a sense difficult to sit there and say precisely what happened exactly how, but yes, I mean, the point is that there was a, there was a, a military conquest for sure. And there was eventually religious conversion, um, uh, as well as linguistic conversion. But again, we're talking about a, an extraordinarily complex period, centuries and centuries ago. And the point is that the people who were there in Palestine before the Arab conquest were there after the Arab conquest. And many of them became Muslim, of course, which was the case across that region, across the, the Mashriq. In other words, in, in Egypt, in Syria, um, in many different places, many people became Muslim and Muslims of different denominations, of course. There are different kinds of Muslims and many remain Christian, um, especially sort of Orthodox Christian. And many eventually, you know, much later, or not many, but a few, and there were Armenians, of course, there were many different groups that lived in this, this region. So again, I don't get too high in the book. My book really focuses on the 19th century and 20th century. So I don't get too hung up on these early, because I think these are futile debates at one, at one level to say, who's there first back in the day several thousand years ago? That's a completely mystifying and, and mystical point. There's no point, I really, really, there's no point going there. Yeah, that's fair. What, so, so talk to me about what's happening in the late Ottoman Empire in the Mashriq and and what what is changing from before and i guess this is sort of 1850s 1860s on when we start to get a shift yeah that's and that's a really that's a, an excellent question and the answer is is very simple that the ottoman empire until the mid 19th century was clearly like other pre-modern empires was an islamic empire that ruled over a variety of different subject groups and peoples multi-ethnic multi-religious multilinguistic this is sort of well known among the historians of the period. So there's no, there's really no debate about this. But it wasn't an empire, obviously, there was no equality, certainly no political equality in the empire. And there were various discriminatory codes that, um, that reduced or that made certain groups, um, unequal. 
uh, without without any question. But everyone, in a sense, was unequal to the Sultan, who was the the ruler of the empire, uh, including Muslims. But Christians and Jews and other people of the book had certain protections, but also certain disabilities. Uh, in other words, there were certain discriminations against them. But all ruled, and it's important to understand that the, the hierarchies of the Jewish and the Christian communities were part and parcel of this Ottoman imperial system. So anyone who tells you otherwise doesn't know the history really very well. That doesn't mean that there wasn't discrimination, because of course there was. That doesn't mean that there wasn't a variety and a variability in the nature of coexistence, because of course there was. But by and large, up until the mid 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was an empire of difference. It sort of, it didn't try to make everyone the same. It sort of accepted the fact that this was a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, um, multi-linguistic um, empire. And, but it really wanted was order and stability and people paying their taxes. And when people didn't pay their taxes or rebelled, they were smashed and crushed. And that was the nature and the rhythm of the empire. I'm, I'm really sort of really reducing a much more complex history. And it's in the mid 19th century that in response to both local rebellions, internal rebellions, European interventions, the 19th century ideas of what modern states were all about, the ideas of citizenship, and and the, the notion and the realization on the part of Ottoman rulers that they had to change the system to survive because Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798, the French invaded Algeria in 1830, the Greeks rebelled and achieved an independent state in the 1820s by 1830. Uh, Muhammad Ali of Egypt, who was a governor, rebelled. I mean, there were rebellions throughout the, the empire. And so the Ottomans realized that they had to change their empire and go from being an empire of difference, where you basically stratify and, and differentiate people and not make them the same and discriminate amongst people and groups. They had to change that into creating a common Ottoman identity in the 19th century. And so that's the main transformation that takes place. This idea of and the contradiction, it's because it is a contradiction, trying to maintain an imperial system, which which by definition is unequal in an empire, and at the same time trying to make people who are, who had been and were religiously and ethnically different, trying to give them a common Ottoman identity in the 19th century, trying to create a new definition of being Ottoman. And that's what you see in the mid 19th century. And it's in that context that there was a, a tremendous renaissance in the in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, in the Arab provinces, the Mashriq, but also in other parts of the Ottoman Empire, so Arabic, Armenian, other languages, uh, flourished in the 19th century as people uh, sort of took advantage of this Ottoman Reformation, so to speak, uh, to sort of identify and elaborate new forms of identity. And it's in that period, sort of mid-19th century to the late 19th century, that the modern definition of Arab as a citizen or as an identity that's a political identity that's and a social and cultural identity that transcends religious difference, very much knowing that there's an alternative, a negative alternative, which is sectarian identity, develops. In the in the 19th century so the very definition of modern arab as someone who can be muslim christian or jewish developed in this period and this is in, seen as an ottoman reformation it's 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 sort of a local reformation ottoman reformation and arab reformation it's it's many different things layered together because the arabs were under ottoman rule but the ottomans sort of weren't sort of um they still didn't impose on the Arabs their language, Turkish language, and so on and so forth. So the Arabs had the space and the ability to be both Ottoman and Arab in the modern sense in the 19th century. There's this, that's, what I, that's what I refer to as, as, as an age of coexistence. There's this important moment that you write about in the 1860s, a, a massacre of Christians in, yeah. in Damascus. Yes. Tell me about that. July 1860. Well, like, like any reformation, like any massive revolution, like any huge change in the 19th century or any period for that matter, uh, there's a lot of tension, a lot of contradiction, a lot of backlash, a lot of instability, a lot of resistance. And so what happened in Damascus 1860 is that there was indeed a, in the context of these, this reformation, 
which in Ottoman is known as the Tanzimat or the, or the reordering of the empire. In the context of this reformation, um, there was a massacre of Christians. And again, historians debate whether the root cause was economic, in other words, Western economic penetration of the East and the, the depression, uh, economic depression and the scapegoating of Christians or whether it was something else. Um, the historians debate the, the, the root causes, but the bottom line is that there was a massacre. There's no question. It was the largest single massacre of Eastern Christians in the Ottoman Empire in Syria, specifically throughout the 400 years of Ottoman rule in Syria. And it was, a, it was an enormous massacre, and it was devastating. And the Europeans intervened to help the Ottomans restore order but of course, the Europeans intervened in the Orientalist fashion, basically saying, look how barbaric the Muslims are, uh, ignoring the fact that the British and the French and the Americans had committed massacres on a far larger scale in many different parts of the world. The Ottoman state also sent an army to restore order. And it's in that moment that people on the ground, and when we can get into, again, the Ottoman sort of motivations, it's, it's, it's quite complicated. But in that moment, people in the Arab provinces, in Damascus, in Lebanon, in Palestine, basically realized that the regions was at a crossroad. The region was at a crossroads. Either you could, you could give in to the worst impulses because coexistence, of course, is predicated on religious difference. You coexist because there is difference. And in this context of reformation and change, just like in America today, you have people who are very anxious about change and multiculturalism. And racial diversity and, and and in other parts of the world you have similar kinds of dynamics so too in the ottoman empire and so what happened in after 1860 is that some people realized that that the way forward had to be in acknowledging that there was a very real danger of sectarianism developing in the ottoman empire in other words people focusing on what is negative and what divides them and instead, they, they, they realized that there was a danger of that. And so the alternative was, in fact, to build um, and strengthen what they saw, th saw and thought and believed, genuinely believed, to be a, a necessary modern culture of coexistence that, on the one hand, recognized religious difference, and on the other hand, sought to transcend that difference in a common political and national identity. And this is the basis of virtually all modern Arab, um, as well as Ottoman thought in the sense of, of, of recognizing, unlike, unlike the United States or, or, or let's say Europe or France, where you deny, you, you just, you go against religion. There, the, the idea in the, in the Arab and the Ottoman sphere was basically recognize religious difference, never try to make everybody the same religiously, maintain religious difference, um, honor religious difference, respect religious difference, and at the same time try to transcend it, which is why I use the word ecumenical, because that captures this idea of recognizing that there's something that binds us together that's larger than our differences without ignoring or denying these differences. So I don't know, that's probably a very complicated answer, but, but that's, that's the answer. And what would the effect be? Well, the effect is that you have a choice, just like in America, you can be a racist or an anti-racist, you can be in the in the Middle East, it's, it's a different, of course, political economy, it's a different political structure. So I don't want to make these parallels. I'm just doing this to to illuminate or elucidate for people who may be listening. <clears throat> the, the, the common factor is basically you have people who say, well, no, you know, so this is this is the, the, the profound sort of um, moment that they were in people who recognize that there's a danger that people are going to withdraw into sectarian identities. So a Christian would say, well, I'm a Christian first, and everything else is not important. And and others who said, no, that's the wrong way of thinking. That actually is going to lead us to a dead end. Um, that's going to lead us to a political dead end. That's going to lead us to a, a an intellectual dead end. It's going to lead us to a moral dead end, an ethical dead end. And instead, we need to recognize the fact that we live in a multi-religious world and try to transcend it through education, through schooling, through through what are called national schools, not nationalist schools, but national schools. In other words, schools that were built for the first time specifically after 1860, after the massacre of Damascus. Basically, people saying, we need to educate our youth and remind them and educate them and inculcate in them 
the idea that they are both Muslim and Christian and Jewish or Muslim or Christian or Jewish and at the same time Arab and Ottoman. Do you see what I'm saying? So that that and so the idea was that schools were created, presses developed, books were published, an entire educational sort of renaissance flourished in the context of the late Ottoman period. It was extraordinary how many schools were opened and how many um how many books were published and what an extraordinary sort of moment it was. And this is all in the context of a single sovereign Ottoman frame. So in other words, we have Lebanon and Palestine and Syria and Egypt are not all separate states. They're all under Ottoman sovereignty in this period, which makes it really important. So people can travel, can go back and forth and so on and so forth. Who was Butrus al-Bustani? He was a survivor of the massacres of 1860. Uh, there were there was a set of massacres in Lebanon and Mount Lebanon as well as in Damascus in 1860, and he was from Mount Lebanon, which is in today what is today Lebanon, the state of Lebanon, and he was from a prominent family. He was a Protestant uh, convert, in other words, he was a convert to Protestantism from Maronite Eastern Christianity. He w worked with the American missionaries. There was an American mission in the Middle East, in Syria, in Lebanon. He worked with them. Uh, he was a printer. He was a missionary himself. He was a church founder, a native church founder. Um, but he was also an extraordinary sort of intellect, intellectual and a uh, an author, a writer, a translator. And he basically, after 1860, he, he's the one who recognized more clearly than anyone else that the region was at a crossroads. The diversity of the region could be used to undermine the region's cohesiveness, or the diversity could be used to elevate a sense of a potential and commonality by, again, building this idea of respecting difference and transcending it at the same time. So he opened up the very first national school in the Ottoman Empire in the aftermath of the 1860 massacres. And and to him, there one owes enormous credit because he he was he was um, he, he was the person who advocated the idea of a national state that included all people of all religions in the empire, and at the same time respected these religions and this religious difference, honored and valued this religious difference, and at the same time sought to transcend this difference in a national commonality. So rather than being, as I said, anti-religious, you're being for religious difference and transcending it, which is a difficult thing to do, of course, because you're always up against people who say, no, that's that's nonsense, that's rubbish, that'll never work. You're against both local, Eastern, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, other sort of uh, groups who have their own schools just for their own communities. And of course, you have missionary schools, foreign missionary schools, American, British, French, German, Russian, and so on, that are about converting people to whatever faith they belong to. And then you had Ottoman schools, which also, in a sense, tried to transcend religious difference. But remember, for the Ottoman state, and this, I should have said this earlier, but for the Ottoman state, the whole point of the Reformation is not ultimately equality. It's about sovereignty. It's about maintaining the sovereignty of the empire. So that's the priority for the Ottoman state. It's not, they don't care about equality as such. Equality was simply a new method of trying to strengthen the empire. But the point is, was the empire, whereas for Bustani, who's in the provinces and who's an individual, the point was, in fact, equality and transcending religious difference for its own sake. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Usama Makdisi, professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the author of the book, The Age of Coexistence, The Economical Frame and the Making of the Modern Arab World. Is it in this time period and because what's happening there that we get this word sectarian? Yes, sectarianism, not sectarian, but sectarianism. In other words, the problem of religious difference as a problem that threatens national unity. So sectarianism is really the antithesis of national unity in the Middle East. The term itself is coined in this period and a little, uh, you know, late 19th, early 20th century. It comes into usage, I should say, in this period. And it's specifically um, a term that is thought of as the antithesis of national unity. So it's coined by those who are for national unity and who see those who use religious or ethnic difference as a way of undermining national unity. So the opposite of sectarianism is not secularism, it's national unity. 
And it's important to understand that in terms of the Middle East. So from after the, and I think you even said before the 1860s, for the Ottoman Empire, you still have a tradition of coexistence in, in the region. But, at, but after the 1860 massacre, the response to it, you would say the, the, the forces for coexistence and tolerance were mostly winning the day for the next 50, 60 years? It depends where. It really depends where on the empire, because what happens in the empire, and this is the other part of the book that I talk about, the empire really splits, uh, in, conceptually splits into two different sort of geographies. The northern part of the empire, so what is today Turkey, the Balkans, Greece, and, and these areas, Bulgaria, Serbia, in the northern part and Turkey, uh, in the northern part is, of the empire, basically ethno-religious nationalism comes to the fore. So the idea of of being being Greek by definition means you, you cannot be Muslim. Being Serbian means you're not going to be Muslim. Even though Greeks and Serbians and others may be, you know, against each other as Christians, but nevertheless, they definitely don't include Muslims. And there was a huge problem because, again, the Balkans, like Turkey itself, or what what becomes Turkey, are also multi-religious areas. And and so when you start when you start emphasizing ethno-religious nationalism, in other words, the idea that the nation belongs to one particular group based on ethno-religious identification or solidarity, you end up excluding all those who don't belong. And the problem, of course, in a multi-religious, multi-ethnic landscape is that that creates huge divisions and extraordinarily difficult um, and violent processes that take place that overwhelm whatever was positive in the age of coexistence in the northern part of the empire and the Ottoman Reformation, it's completely overwhelmed by ethno-religious nationalisms, competing ethno-religious nationalisms. And that's why you have the Armenian uh, question, or the, the persecution of the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire begins not in the 15th century, or 16th, or 17th, or 18th centuries. There were Armenians living there all along but in the 19th century, and then specifically in the late 19th century, as part and parcel of this ethno-religious nationalism. Because again, if you're going to be with one group, you're opposed to other groups. Um, and so in, on an, in, a, in, a, in a diverse landscape, the, that's in the northern part of the empire. In the southern part of the empire, so the Arab parts, including the Mashriq, including what is today Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, Egypt, from, from the from the mid 19th century after 1860 all the way until the end of the empire what you see in fact is a persistence of this age of coexistence until the very end of the empire in fact i would say and i make this point in the book that nowhere in the world in this period is there any place where muslims and christians and jews are more have more in common and have more um a deeper sense of cultural commonality than here, than than the Mashriq. Nowhere else in the world. Certainly not in Europe, certainly not North America, certainly not anywhere else as far as I'm aware. Nowhere do you have this kind of culture thriving in the way it thrives in the Mashriq, in the late, as opposed to the northern part of the empire where ethno-religious nationalisms uh, basically destroy the possibilities of coexistence. And you say this coexistence lasts all the way till the end of the Ottoman Empire, which would come to an end in 1917 uh, or 1918 and, and the end of, of World War I. Uh, what, and then the British sort of take over. Yeah. What, what happens at that moment when the British take over? Well, there's a choice, like, like everything else. I mean, the, the question is, sort of, so specifically talking about the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, the Arab East, the Mashriq, this becomes the last place in the world that's colonized by Western powers. So in other words, after Africa, after Asia, after the Americas were colonized, the turn of the Arabs came, the Arabs of the East came um, after World War One, And the British and the French who divided up this region in, in what we refer to as the Sykes-Picot moment or agreement of 1916, the British and the French basically, of course, divided this region up to suit their own imperial interests. They knew perfectly well that there was no interest in dividing up what was, in fact, a common region that had been under one sovereign, that had proven uh, had a proven capacity of coexistence. All that was ignored by the British and the French because they do what empires, especially foreign empires or or um, Western empires, do, which is to divide constantly divide 
to rule, divide and rule. And so they, they create separate states. There's no reason for them to have created separate states, but they do it anyway. They create, they, they create the state of Lebanon. They create the state of Syria. They create the state of Palestine. Uh, and they, and they, they create the state of Iraq. And they do so specifically to parcel out the region amongst themselves, the British and the French, that is. So in other words, the division of the region. So that's a huge blow against the culture of coexistence because what you're doing is you're separating people out that lived under one common sovereign frame. Think of the United States. And then you're dividing them up into sovereign, literally sovereign states. But of course, they don't have sovereignty because the British and the French rule. And you divide them up. And that's what the British and the French did. It was a catastrophic decision. And these are and new the lines. lines. These are new. I mean, these weren't based on historical No, of course. Lines. They're absolutely totally new lines. And they're lines that the British and the French basically, as imperial powers, as foreign powers, uh, divide up the region to suit their interests, to, to, for, to share, to create spheres of influence because of oil, because of strategic areas, because of ideas of prestige and imperial prestige and so on and so forth. They do that. Yeah, these are absolutely new lines. And of course, there's a question of where you draw the lines, and it becomes a huge issue everywhere. And what does this mean for Palestine? Well, for Palestine, it's especially sort of catastrophic because what happens, so the British and the French create these things called mandates, which after, so during World War One and after World War One, actually after the First World War, uh, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, is, is credited uh, largely misinterpreted but but credited with with the idea of self-determination this idea that that peoples around the world have a right to determine their own political future that's not quite what wilson meant in fact that's not at all what wilson meant wilson was committed to racial hierarchies but nevertheless people around the world understood the term to mean exactly what it sounds like self-determination and the british and the french were compelled to play along with that idea to say we're not really colonizing people just to take their their resources. We're here to help the natives. That was the language that the British and the French used, to help the natives fulfill the idea of self-determination. So that's the idea behind the creation of Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon as separate states. We're going to help the Syrians, the Iraqis, and the Lebanese achieve independence down the line, but they need our assistance. That's the myth of the mandate system and the colonialism inherent in it. In Palestine, however, the British didn't even pretend that they were going to help the natives, i.e. the Palestinians, achieve independence. The British said, we're here to fulfill the terms of the Balfour Declaration. In other words, we want to create a Jewish national home in Palestine. And at the same time, we commit to not violating the civil and religious rights of the existing so-called, quote-unquote, non-Jewish communities in Palestine. So the British privileged European Zionists the Balfour Declaration was written to European Zionists, and it, it privileges the creation, in effect, of a Jewish state, which is what the European Zionists wanted in Palestine, despite the fact that Palestine was overwhelmingly Arab and was multi-religious. And here you have this idea, this tension, this problem. If you take an ethno-religious nationalist idea, which is what Zionism, political Zionism, uh, became in the 19th century, and you impose it through colonialism on a land that's overwhelmingly not Jewish, there's a problem. And that problem is being played out until this very moment. How do you create a Jewish state if the vast majority of the population is not Jewish, is in fact Muslim and Christian and native? How do you do that? There's a, there's a huge contradiction. And what is the justice of creating a Jewish state in a land which is overwhelmingly multi-religious? inhabited by people who are obviously indigenous to that part of the world. They've been there for centuries and, you know, who ha who belong infinitely more there than Europeans and Americans who have some fantasy of belonging there. What what starts happening on the ground in Palestine? The British, start well, the British basically commit themselves to fulfilling the terms of the Balfour Declaration. They privilege European Jewish Zionists administratively, politically, economically in Palestine, in the mandate of Palestine. So they allow the European Zionists to create the infrastructure of a Jewish state, all the while telling the Palestinians themselves, the native population, the majority of the population, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. 
And as the Palestinians protested, first through protests, then through letters, through marches, through demonstrations, through uh, riots, through revolution, through, through any number of means, the British always ignored them or suppressed them time and again, time and again. So no matter what the Palestinians said or did, the British ignored them. Until eventually the British threw up their hands in 1937 and said, you know what, we can't, there's no solution to this problem that we have created, the British, um, by privileging European Zionists. Remember, Zionism does not come from the Jewish indigenous communities of Palestine or the Middle East. Zionism emerged in Europe to respond to European problems of anti-Semitism and nationalism. And it's European Zionists who create this idea and, and, and fantasize about creating a Jewish state in Palestine, even though they knew when they got to Palestine that it was inhabited, that it was lived in by the natives, by Palestinians. And so the, the British realized that there's a problem after a, a major Palestinian revolution in 1936, and they decided to partition Palestine. They say the only solution is partition of Palestine into two states. Nevertheless, they, the British say very openly, we recognize that dividing Palestine, which is overwhelmingly Arab and overwhelmingly owned by Arabs, we recognize that if we do that, it's going to be unjust to the Palestinians, the Arabs, because it's their land that's being taken away to create a Jewish state. And the British recognize, this is so stunning, Mitch, when you think about it, the British recognize and say this in writing in 1937, as they propose a partition plan known as the Peel Partition Plan. The British say very clearly that we understand that there's no history of anti-Semitism. There's no anti-Jewish sentiment that's indigenous to this region in the sense of, in the way it was in Europe. There's no racial anti-Semitism. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, it's not, not these exact words, but words similar to this. The, the, the British are very open. They say, we recognize that there's no history of anti-Semitism in Palestine or in the region. But the Arabs are a generous people. They actually use that phrase, they're generous. And their generosity is going to help us, help us, the Europeans, solve our Jewish problem, the Europeans. Um, and they're going to earn our gratitude, even if it comes at some sacrifice to themselves, to the Arabs. So the Palestinians are going to help us solve our problem at their expense. I, honestly, I don't know what you call this. I call that disingenuousness on an epic scale and, and profound hypocrisy or cognitive dissonance or whatever you want to call it. And the amazing thing is that people on the ground, of course, recognized right away, they saw right through this fraudulent sort of equation, this European Western idea that they're atoning for anti-Semitism at the Palestinians' expense. T tell me. And there were, yeah, there were books written at the time about this including George Antonios, who wrote a famous book called The Arab Awakening, where he basically said in 1938, he said, this is completely, what's happening to the Jews in Europe, he says, is totally unacceptable. I'm paraphrasing again, totally unacceptable, immoral, the persecution of the Jews in Europe. But to solve that at the expense of a people who have no hand in the persecution of the Jews is completely immoral as well. T tell but me more about this 1936 revolution. It's a revolution. There is a revolution. The, the two largest interwar, as in between World War One and World War Two, anti-colonial revolutions anywhere in the world that I'm aware of, are in Palestine in 1936 to 1939, and in Syria earlier in 1925. Both are aimed at, at ending foreign colonial domination. One is directed at the French in Syria. The other one is directed at the British and the Zionists in Palestine and both are smashed and crushed. The British use enormous repression uh, to smash the Palestinian revolution. And then it's in response to the revolution, the uprising, that the British then proposed this partition plan, thinking that that was a, a way out, because they recognized that it was, it was getting very difficult to hold on to Palestine. It was consuming way too many resources. Would you say that the end of this age of coexistence comes almost immediately after World War I, or, or is it a process? No, no. I mean, the age of coexistence continues, I think, until today in, in, in the Arab world, in the, in the Mashrif. The problem, of course, is that it comes under huge stress. So in Palestine, when, when a Jewish state is created, by definition, a Jewish state 
in Palestine destroys the ecumenical frame in Palestine. Because when you're saying you want to create a Jewish state, you're saying you're going to privilege one group over every other, specifically one group. And it becomes a huge problem. And we see that problem playing out until today, honestly. It goes on until today. Um, in the rest of the Arab world, um, and Palestine is destroyed. Anyway, it's destroyed and Israel is created in its place. And then the Palestinians become a stateless people, refugees. And, um, you know, the, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the age of coexistence is destroyed as a whole, because what happens interestingly is that Palestinians then as they reorganize themselves in exile, actually, and as well as inside the survivors inside of Palestine, the interesting thing is how many of them are Muslim and Christian working together, exactly sort of holding on to this idea of coexistence, even in resistance, and in the reconstitution of a Palestinian national um, project. And that, that goes on again until today, I would say. So in one aspect, it's destroyed. In another aspect, it, it continues. In the rest of the region, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, no, that continues. The age of coexistence continues, but it becomes increasingly stressed by problems of nationalism, by nation states, by authoritarian rulers who manipulate religious difference for their own ends, and eventually by the catastrophic U.S. invasions of, of Iraq, um, which has which has devastated the region. I, I wanted to ask about Iraq. Obviously, there are significant differences with Iraq. You, you don't have a, a mass migration happening with the U.S. invasion of 2003. Um, but do you see parallels between what happened in Iraq, how the United States approached it after the fall of Saddam Hussein, and what happened in Palestine? I see, I see similarities to what the British and the French did after World War I with what the Americans did in Iraq after 2003. The difference is that there's a century between those two moments. Uh, but the, the the astonishing point about the U.S. invasion of Iraq and the occupation of Iraq and the division of Iraq, this idea of playing on religious difference and ethnic difference is what the Americans did in the name of sort of leading the natives, so to speak, into independence. It's ex it's almost, I mean, it's the first time it's tragedy, the second time farce. What the Americans did in Iraq was right out of the colonial playbook. And, and, and the results have been catastrophic. And then, of course, what do the Americans do eventually is that they walk away which is what they did. They had some basis still, but they basically washed their hands of this. Having destroyed Iraq, having had it under sanctions before, uh, brutal sanctions regime before, uh, and of course the the goal of getting rid of Saddam Hussein as a, as a dictator is, is belied by the fact that the Americans have, you know, dictatorships throughout the Middle East that are allied to them. So the issue was never the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, as brutal as it was, but it was about something else. And my point is that in the end, the Americans went in, they, they destroyed Iraq, they destroyed the notion of a collective Iraqi sovereignty, and, and the Iraqis are, are still, until today, paying the price for that moment. Yeah, the reason I ask, I, uh, the reason I ask is I, I have Iraqi friends who have always told me that this you know, sectarian violence that we saw emerge after the invasion is a modern thing. It's not something, as we are often told, something rooted uh, in the past. Well, no, I mean, Mitch, you have to understand, like, all your listeners have to understand and know this point. A any society, any society in the world, which has religious or ethnic or any kind of difference, and if you put enough stress and pressure on those differences, can ultimately degenerate into something quite, quite awful. I mean, that's, 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 that's human. I mean, that happens everywhere. It's not just in America. Think about the United States. We have the most powerful government in the world, the most powerful military industrial complex, the most powerful military in the universe right now. But America is riven with all sorts of differences. And can you imagine what would happen if some foreign country came in and started playing off various communities against each other? This place would collapse in a, in a second. Uh, and, and in a sense of violence far greater than anything we've ever seen, I suspect. So the point is, any society with difference is susceptible to people manipulating that difference. It's a real warning for multi-ethnic, multicultural for, for any for any worlds. place, but also but the and the flip side is the extraordinary numbers of people around the the world who fight for something better, who fight for this ecumenical idea, for fight who fight to say we can be different and transcend our difference at the same time, and that in Iraq you said your Iraqi friends I'm sure they're they are the same opinion in that sense that they say that we don't you know that we can be Iraqi and be Sunni and Shi'i and Kurdish and Arab and whatever, 
and be Iraqi. And I think that's an important point as well. The other day we had on Mitri Raheb, uh, a Palestinian Christian pastor mm. on this show. Yeah, yeah, great guy. And, and he talked about pan-Arabism. And mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, do, do, and he said, you know, is it the 1967 war that pan-Arabism came to an end, this idea of a pan-Arabic world, and then sort of led to more religious fundamentalism as, as a political tool. Do, do you see pan-Arabism connected to this age of coexistence? Pan-Arabism is one manifestation of the age of coexistence. In other words, it's again, sort of think about what pan-Arabism is. It's basically the idea that peoples across this divided Arab region, the region that was divided by the British and the French, as I said, after World War One, pan-Arabism comes out as an idea of saying, we need to reunify all these places that have been split up by the British and the French into one sovereign whole. That's the idea. So it's, it's sort of this idea of saying, again, we can transcend these regional differences into a collective whole. That's one aspect of coexistence. There are other theories and ideas. There, there were communists who weren't pan-Arabists, but also believed in unifying these region. There were Islamists who weren't secular pan-Arabists, but also believed in unifying. So there, do you see what I'm saying? There are different manifestations. Different political groups have different ideas about how to maintain or modify the age of coexistence, but they all are coming out, except for the Zionists, who are coming from Europe. Remember this. So the Zionists are coming from Europe. Uh, the, the, the original Zionists are coming from Europe, as in the 19th century Zionists who were leading the Zionist movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine, which is why I see it, uh, them doing so much damage to the ecumenical, to the age of coexistence, because they're, they're responding to European problems and European ideas. All the others are coming out of the region and the history of the region. And they're coming up with different, some more secular, some more religious solutions to this problem of religious difference and political unity. Do, do you think in the early 20th century, a, 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 a single state of Palestine was possible even with, and it gets complicated because of course, after World War II, immigration happens in, in, in huge, huge numbers, which puts stress on any, any, anyone really. But, but do you mm -hmm. think a one state was possible? Well, there was one state. I mean, the British did create one mandate. It was called Palestine. And, and of course, before the British, there was a region that was all connected, all connected together. So what is today, Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, these were all connected together, Jordan <clears throat> and, and, and Egypt. These were all connected to each other. So there, there has been one state. The point is there was a lived experience. There was a lived experience, a shared culture living under one sovereign all that has has been there before the idea is at what price at what price do we continue to insist on this idea on this fantasy of an ethno-religious national estate imposed on a multi-religious part of the world that's really the question and that's what we see playing out right now in gaza in this horrific sort of moment where the the people of gaza are being obliterated by uh, by this genocidal israeli violence you you see what's happening i mean the 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 idea of an ethno-religious nationalist state in a multi-religious part of the world is just not a sustainable idea without extraordinary amounts of violence and even then it's sort of ethically and and, and morally hugely problematic usama mactasi has been our guest Usama Makdisi is a professor of history and chancellor's chair at the University of California, Berkeley, and he is the author of the book, The Age of Coexistence, The Economical Frame and Making of the Modern Arab World. Usama Makdisi, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.